Hello and welcome to this episode of the Alien Familiar Podcast. I am Clayton. I'm Beth. I'm KD. I'm Haley. Jordan. Lenina. KP. And today we are going to t- be talking about the fantasy campaign that we have been running for the past 17 sessions now at the end of this night about the campaign called Abena that we all collaboratively worked together to create this world. And then after the world was created, we created characters for it and have been playing very regularly pretty much every week for the past 17 weeks now. First off, I would like to say where I got the idea for this. The concept of the world creation was a set of rules that I found online, which I will have linked in the show notes, called Dawn of Worlds. This rule set is designed for people who are want to create their own gaming world and use everybody who is around the, the table in order to collaboratively create the backstory of the world, create the topography of the world itself, and all of the things that are going on in the world up until the point where the campaign starts. I modified the rules a little bit so that each individual at the table took on the role of a god. So the system of Dawn of Worlds is breaks down world creation into three different ages. The age of land, the age of races, and the age of relations between the races. The first age, everybody takes turns. In this instance, each god had made a role to see how much power that they had to use during that round in order to spend on different godly acts, such as shaping the land, shaping the climate, creating races within the world, founding civilizations, founding cities, and other events um, going on in the world. During the first age, we had, or rather, before we even began, we all randomly rolled on a table to get the different aspects of our different deities. Some of the people who aren't with us right now who've um, participated... They're not um, dead. Like, they're, they're, they're here. Just okay. not, not in the room. Figured yeah. out. They're not here, so they are dead to me. They're <laughs> <laughs> like a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, who joined us for the Apocalyptia campaign that is currently being released, she played the deity She of the Molten Hammer, also known as Som, whose aspects were of blacksmithing, the winter, the night, the flame, and glory. We also have another player who hasn't had a chance to join us yet on the podcast, who played a um, a goddess of learning. Nina, who is not currently with us tonight, she played a goddess of passion, astronomy, the moon, poetry, and madness. I played a essentially a hidden god of nature who never overtly revealed himself throughout the entire game. Uh, I just played him silently forming and shaping the land throughout the entirety of, of the game. Other players jumped right into making making the land and then populating the land with races. Our other players who had gods or goddesses are... I'm Beth. I had a god of ships, destiny, and storytelling. I had a deity um, of law, zeal, and rulership. Uh, I had a god, her name was Valuara, and she was the goddess of diplomacy, festivity, fertility, beauty, and consent. I made Terminatrix the inverted mother. Her aspects are time, death, sorrow, poison, and mercy. I made a god of a uh, deity of Zephranciata, and she was of sea, humor, intrigue, lust, and magma. Old KP over here made Wick, a god with aspects of darkness, seeking, and time. And after we created our gods, Jordan scared the hell out of us by drawing a picture of what the Terminatrix, (laughs) the inverted mother, looks like. Um, I will post a picture of this in the show notes. During the course of the game, we created a lot of races. (laughs) Once we actually began playing the game or as player characters in this world, each one of the players was asked to choose one particular race that they were going to play for their characters. And then I, I used the Savage Worlds game system for the role-playing game aspect of the greater campaign. The overall campaign, the idea behind it was that everybody was going to be members of a single mercenary company. 
This was coming off of a campaign where everybody had kind of been at each other's throats. This was quite a palate cleanser to have everybody working together. Before we even made characters, we had a vote to see who was going to be the character who was going to be leading this this band of mercenaries. Um, does anyone anybody want to talk about who they're playing and how they got to the, the <clears throat> station where they they're in at the beginning of the campaign? Maybe we should start with our leader. Okay, I'm I'm playing a half elf wizard named Talon. My whole plan was to put together a mercenary army to gather up all of the relics of a wizard order that had been destroyed by the humans. All these relics were left laying around unprotected, and since I was the last one of that order, I thought it my responsibility to gather them up and dispose of them responsibly, and so I started hiring people, starting with Starting with me, um, my character is Anna, and uh, Talon first picked me up off of an island on which I had been shipwrecked 17 years prior, Um, a little bit to tie back in with my um, god, the storyteller, where he's the god of ships and destiny. He basically creates weather events to cause ships to wreck and other tragic things to happen in order to make stories to pass the time, just anything that he finds amusing. So my character started out, uh, she got shipwrecked when she was 18 and then had been on this island for 17 years, um, occasionally being visited by the god in the form of a storybook that would read to her from various stories that she didn't realize at the time were actually true stories that he had had a hand in happening. She feels towards the storyteller that he basically saved her life and saved her sanity because she had these stories to keep her company all this time that she was alone, but she doesn't realize that the storyteller actually is the one who put her there. Beth, do you want to kind of go into your personal motivation for making this character as she was? The reason I did the uh, character as she is is because I've had a I had a really long break in role playing due to a long illness, and I was out of I was sick and away from role playing for ten plus years, and so I was coming back into it really nervous about having to role play again and not certain how well I would do in the group. So I created a character that was just as separated from society and kind of at that point pretty certain that she wasn't ever going to be part of society again and so she's going through all these emotions of like having considered herself basically dead and then here she is back in the world uh she actually one of the artifacts that talon was looking for the gem of desire had actually been given to her by the storyteller so that was why he came to that island and then anna traded him the gem of desire for her passage off of the island and then ended up joining the mercenary company My character, uh, I'm not sure if it was minor KPs that joined next. Um, I don't remember. One of us, one of us two. I think one of the two of us were the next ones. My character is Magnus Rurikson, and he is of the race known as the Vikinger. Um, They're humanoid, essentially very similar to humans, except they're just a bit bigger, a bit stronger, have uh, completely red eyes. Very original, I know. He... Joined up with the group because he was exiled from his people. Because in the sort of last couple events that we had within the world creation phase, um, I had created this race and then ordered them to invade another people's lands on a sort of Armageddon, Ragnarok, you know, no going back, we take this land or we die sort of mission. I was playing a character whom did not agree with that sentiment and so was exiled from his, his people. And I fill the role of champion in the mercenary group, as well as uh, fourth in command. I am in charge of the uh, sword unit, so a portion of the army. And my character, um, mechanics-wise, is a berserker. You know, uses two weapons. Uh, There's an adage we quote a lot in the game, and we've quoted actually on this podcast before. But um, I'm not trapped in here with you, you're trapped in here with me. (laughs) Um, in which, you know, I'm, my combat tactic is usually run into the biggest group of enemies and start swinging. In terms of what, I guess, inspired me to sort of play this character, I, you know, never really have played a Berserker before, uh, aside from, you know, one game, I, which was also talked about in another podcast, that evil game. Um, and so I really wanted to give it a try. 
But at the same time, I didn't want to be... I wanted to have sort of more complexity to the character. Um, and so, you know, there's just a couple things here and there. You know, he is rather brutal when it comes down to it, but he cares very much so for the mercenary group and his friends, etc. And also, you know, something that I've kind of tried to do through roleplay is he doesn't speak the human tongue very well, but he's relatively okay at speaking his, his native tongue. And so uh, Ruri, or, sorry, Magnus kind of has this specific way of talking in which stunted and, and gruff, but... Uh, Can we get a sample? You know, he'll be sitting by a fire and see someone approach and kind of gruffly nod and go, mm, Hello, friend. You friend? Sort of a... Stunted speech, but, you know, he'll be much more eloquent in his, his native tongue. But yeah, that's sort of my character. Um, he was taken in, as I said, by the mercenary group after being exiled from his people. And at the moment in the campaign, we are sort of dealing with that invasion and Magnus's place within it. So The next person to join the mercenary company, which would become the Free People's Army, by the way, was my character, Alkir of the Wind Tamed. In Zephyr society, your last name is the name of the city in which you were born or hail from. The Zephyr are avian. They are feathered beaks. They do have hands and opposable thumbs and indeed also have um, a membranous sort of like a flying squirrel. (laughs) Um, Or maybe a pterodactyl. I don't know. Um, But... Uh, so they're not capable of just standing around and all of a sudden taking flight like a bird. Like a helicopter. They need a good running start, uh, they need a high thing to glide from, um, or they need a Magnus to throw them. That's happened once. <laughs> At least once. Our own version of the Cannonball Special. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they are also, uh, within eyesight, uh, telepathic. For races that are not telepathic, they can sort of open a channel and then communicate openly one at a time with someone and for Zephyr specifically, um, they can sort of form range extenders um, or, you know, bridges. And basically you could have an entire city of Zephyr communicating telepathically with a few Zephyr serving as the, um, as the, the bridge. And so as a result of that, first names are unique, but there's no need for individual last names in Zephyr society because you can see someone and know immediately who they are, where they're from. Um, So there's a whole bunch of Zephyr out there with names like the last names, like The Wind Tamed, um, The End Beginning, and I can't recall the The name of my... The Sea Uncharted. The Sea Uncharted, is that right? Cool, thanks Haley. Um, Haley, our lore keeper. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's that's the Zephyr. Um, Alkir specifically... The Wind Tamed is a uh, one of how many Clayton floating islands? I believe there originally there were eight. So um, eight floating islands, you know, fantasy m- magnetism, um, just float and drift around aimlessly, never changing altitude. The Zephyr, very early on, I made them ma- made their race a uh, master of sail and cartography, and I commanded them, or my avatar did to turn one of these floating islands into a controllable floating city or trade ship. Um, Lots and lots of sails, very elaborate. Um, They can't change altitude, but they can ride the winds and move the city around as they please. It no longer just drifts aimlessly. And it's called the Wind Tamed. And Alkir, um, from the age of a very young birdman, about 16 maybe, um, up until his equivalent of late 20s. Like the film um, Birdman? Um, less washed up actor, more, um, hopeful, young, noble with a heart of gold. Okay. okay. Um, could you say that the child of a bird man is a young chick? You could say that. (laughs) Um, uh, KP has gotten no end of, of shit for (laughs) his delightful bird people. I love birds. I love birds. And I don't know why anyone has to take that love from me. And twist it and manipulate it and make me feel sad. <laughs> oh, um, I appreciate your love for birds. Thank you. Anyway, yeah, so Alkir, about ten years, um, was born into the ruling family um, that commands and oversees this floating trade ship city. He was, at some point down the line, to you know, in, in secession to take over, but his uncle was um, a healthy you know, bird man and um, you know, had many more years ahead of him. 
Um, and so after being honorably discharged from the Zephyr Navy, um, he joined up with the Lumenic Order, which is an order of Zephyr, whose objective is to uh, assimilate the best of all encountered technology using their floating island trade vessel as their hub. And so um, Alkir was free to roam about. At some point, Talon stopped by, the wind tamed, and learning of these items and of your quest and of your true spirit, he uh, joined up, and his experience with the Zephyr Navy and with commanding bird marines, uh, I suppose, uh, and in, in sailing and cartography, um, bumped him up to being um, second in command of this outfit. My my title is, or my, my rank is field marshal, and my title is actually quartermaster, um, so I just sort of see uh, oversee the logistics of the Free People's Army, um, and in the event of our dear general's absence, um, I step in to lead. Yeah, so Desdemona, she is uh, a very interesting character. The reason I wanted to play a character like her, um, in when making characters, you have to like come up with a concept, like rowdy police officer or something like that. It's a terrible concept. I, I know. Just rowdy police <laughs> officer? It's like a stripper identity. <laughs> I love it. What, is that just like... Uh, Rowdy Rodney Piper, but you guys like a police <laughs> officer? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, the concept I came up with Desdemona was Tragic Ingenue, because I get a lot of slack for playing these overtly, like, sexual femme fatale characters over and over and over again. I like playing faces. It makes me happy. So I wanted to play the exact opposite of this overtly sexual character and made someone who's very, like, naive and innocent and is very dumb when it comes to understanding, like, social norms of, like, just, like, certain levels of maturity that she hasn't yet. But she's just so sweet and kind and just a bleeding heart. And I really wanted to explore what that kind of character would be put in, like, in a mercenary company in this, like, harsh war environment. It should so, be noted that this character is still extremely hot. She just yes, doesn't know it. Of course. <laughs> All of the charisma um, traits that can be taken that involve uh, sheer uh, attractiveness are on Desdemona. Yeah, oh, so and, accurate statement. And at this point, with the exception of the Noble Edge, which had to be taken at the very beginning, she has everything that gives a bonus to her charisma. Yeah, I in started the, out my the, charisma. In the Savage World rule system. So Plus, on paper, it's the same character you always play. Way to make me feel like shit. I've been trying really hard, okay? See, see, this is my bird people. These are my bird happiness. This is my airplane. Let me have this. You know, guys, I, I like to think that um, the bird people were the friends we made along the way. <laughs> I, I feel like... Haley, you're, it's not the paper that makes the character. It's it's the spirit and the heart and the personality that you add to it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to feed well, some baby Well, anyway, <laughs> amazing. Uh, I really happy with her. I think she's very different from a lot of the other characters at play. Uh, Desdemona is a half-nymph. She is. I'm just being a shit, by Thank the way. Thank you. Uh, Desdemona's a half-nymph. The nymphs was, I think, the Terminatrix was the first avatar, but nymphs were the first race that was created. And um, mm. the nymphs are sculpted of the earth and made of the earth, so they take on its qualities. Desdemona is uh, a half-nymph. So uh, her mother is a nymph. They're an all-female race, and they sculpt each other. And she, when when she was born, because nymphs are sculpted of their elements, she is sculpted of her mom. So she became her mom and killed her when she was born, and she's currently on a quest to try and find her dad, who may or may not be a human, may or may not be the storyteller who is Beth's god. My dad might be a book. It's complicated. I'm on a quest. My mother is a fish. Yeah, uh, I just really wanted to explore, like, sad characters who, like, try really hard and are really optimistic and just, like, as a player, know that it's not going to work out for them, but play a character who's, like, trying so hard and is ready to have all of these wonderful things happen, this, like, bleeding optimism, and just, you know, crush their soul. Because that's what I do, apparently. I got on a tangent. I'll do this really quick. I met up with the team. I was in the tavern looking for my dad, and Taylor was like, she draws a crowd, and she knows how to talk to people. So I'm the staff sergeant and envo envoy? Envoy? Um, so, I think envoy. 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 And my job is to work on diplomacy, find peaceful negotiations when we can. And if not, then everybody else gets to do their shit. And you also... Oh, and I recruit. I recruit. I uh, keep the army... 
um, well-populated. <clears throat> we are an elite army, so we only get the best of the best. And I'm also uh, the musician slash standard bearer, so I'm in charge of making spirit rolls for the army when we fight things. <gasps> oh, hold on. I'm also a spy. I, I kind of forget. You just do everything. <laughs> I do everything. Like, okay, I'm, this one I mean wholeheartedly. You're a really bad spy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know she's a bad spy. I took spy because uh, she's really pointless in battles, except for making moral checks. She has a flute. She doesn't own a weapon. She just has a flute. And uh, I wanted to make her, like, helpful so I decided she was going to be a spy, but she's not very good at being a spy. She's she's just like, hi, can you tell us all the battle plans? That would be very helpful. She, she just has no concept of it. Didn't you also join up because you thought that either Talon or I might be your, your dad, dad? Yeah. Well, uh, to be fair, Magnus is my adoptive dad. I care about him so deeply. I don't think Desdemona has ever lied. She doesn't lie. Or prevent. You're, you're a terrible spy. <laughs> Uh, there is uh, the difference between lying and not telling the truth. Frankly. I don't think I've ever heard her prevaricate. I mean, like, she just says things <laughs> and, and means them, and they're true, which is lovely. But also, you know, because of that sheer level of attractiveness, like, people, like, are just, like, blinded by you. Like, you walk, like, go into a tavern for a connection <clears throat> meeting, and everyone's like, Ah! Oh, <laughs> so hot! Oh, my God! Who... <laughs> Who is she? And you're over there, like, hair blowing in the wind, like, a spy. (laughs) (laughs) And then everyone's like, oh, now we have to kill her. I love that. Thank you. (laughs) Moving on. Nita. Hello. Yes, I am playing, uh, her name is Selixer. She is um, a Celian, who are fish creatures that uh, have... Like scaly appearances, but can live in both land and water. But if on the land for too long, then they will dehydrate and then eventually die. Oh, in case it's confusing, this is Lenina. Yes. Oh, right. We've, we've had both Ninas on at various times, and I don't know how you. I I, I yourself, introduced but... myself as Lenina. Oh, okay. I'll just, just cut that out. A, forget a... forget anything I ever said. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I joined. I joined uh, because I had never left the homeland of where the Celians are most populated, and Home as... You know, it's, a, it's a land. <laughs> it's both. It's like underwater and above water, um, because we I believe made connections with the mainland at some point for trading purposes. We also have a really cool fountain of life that will heal wounds or purify diseases or poisons, etc. There's some iffy things in there. Haven't really tried it or tested it out yet with in-game yet, uh, which will be fun. Um, I joined up with everybody to explore and learn more about the world and attempt to push magic that is harvested via the air, or attempted to, and try to see if we can create higher advanced technology by combining things. Does your character have any other motives for <laughs> things that they often do while they are out and about uh, in the world? I don't know. Um, she's very... From this goo with go. <laughs> That's one way to explain it. She um, likes to sleep with anyone or anything. Um, my most recent endeavor was... I guess I didn't successfully seduce, but almost. The piranha people... Sal Hagen. Sal Hagen. You racist. <laughs> the product people didn't have a name for a long time. No, they, like their creator decided forgot. I kind of forgot yeah, they existed. They, they were like just the, the the poor, poor, poor bastards who like got made and nothing. No one ever did anything with them. I'm the only person in the party that speaks their language, and I took it because the Zephyr have a three way alliance with the Sal Hagen. Hey? <laughs> <laughs> the Zephyr have a three way alliance with the. The Zephyr have a triple alliance with <laughs> the Sauhagen elves and Zephyr. But a lot of it is, um, there are secrets involved with a lot of that, but I don't think we're talking about those today, specifically. Um, no, let's from everybody's secrets. I want to know. I'm going to read it first, but I want to know. I want to know everybody else's. Can you show me how you're going around breeding with the world? <laughs> Um, that uh, Phil Collins rendition brought to you by KP. I also... My role in the party includes um, 
healing literally anybody that tries to die. I am both magic and non-magical healing. I am also a pacifist, which is kind of a problem in the middle of a war. I will tell you that it has given me no end of frustration trying to come up with ways to engage you in the story, engage you in the plot lines, give you something to do during the mass battles that we do. I think about it a lot. I think about it often. Just ask Beth. I tell her how frustrated I am. I about. hear about it every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that there's been a bunch of different um, RP that I'm pretty sure you just threw in there for my sake, which I do really appreciate. Uh, like that I thought it was pretty cool. I feel like I'm not getting a lot of use out of the hindrances that I should be, but uh, I feel like pacifist is enough to deal with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and especially in this setting, uh, pacifist is very high up there as far as uh, what is very limiting for you. I remember there was one time I thought um, I could get away with just sleeping with the big bad, and everybody was else was just like, don't do that. Okay, that's a very good segue. Um <laughs> first, first, I will uh, very briefly go over the characters or the player, the, the characters whose players aren't here. We've got <clears throat> Nina. She is playing a werewolf. We also have another player who hasn't been on the podcast yet. She is playing an elven mage, and Lara is playing a a very very strong warrior of Psalm, She of the Molten Hammer. Lara's character has been receiving some uh, guidance from her deity throughout this campaign. She recently forged star armor. Yep. The main focus of this campaign has been you guys going out and being this big mercenary company You got, with the player characters being the leaders of this group. You've been in some mass combats, and we started out in human lands and kind of s- spread out from there. But um, I kind of want to ask you guys all to kind of tell me what you think have been... What did you think about the Tomb of Horrors, because I converted the Tomb of Horrors into Savage Worlds from old school Dungeons and Dragons and ran that in this system. And I should also mention that the magic system in this world is very different from typical Savage Worlds. Uh, What I did for this magic system was I essentially took the superheroes uh, companion rules. We're using those for magic in this system. So in this system, or in this game, magic users are head and shoulders in power above pretty much everyone else. And at this point in the campaign, Jordan's character, Talon, is most definitely within the top five most powerful individuals in the world at this point. (laughs) So with that said, I haven't really incorporated very many spellcasters. I believe at this point in the campaign, we've had a total of five other spellcasters besides Jordan's character and the Elven Mage character. Uh, doesn't Nina's character also count as a spellcaster? That is correct. I mm-hmm. completely f- I always forget that you're that you have magical healing. Yeah, I'm level last few then. <laughs> yeah. How was that experience of going through the Tomb of Horrors for you all? I felt like it was kind of it was kind of awful just because it was so long and Talon got stuck in an anti-magic cage fairly early on, which is not fun. But at the same time, like, that was the first point in the game where I really felt really useful. Because I had, like, the ability... I had taken, like, traps as one of my, like, special... as one of my defining interests. I have really good, like, notice and, like, survival. And then also just solving the puzzles. Like, I really felt like I was more in my element there than I was with some of the combat. I felt like, <clears throat> well, it was very, it was, you did a lot of work and a good job in adapting um, the dungeon to Savage Worlds. You know, the techie characters definitely shined the most, which was fair, it was a dungeon. Um, but I did feel like in, in certain circumstances, um, even with our magic users, we didn't quite have the spell repertoire needed to navigate some of the traps. I detect magic. <clears throat> Ooh, dusty. Whoa, you got some cut in your throat? Yes. Yeah. Stroke out for a second? Is it a magic spell? Um, and now we were able to get around that quite a bit, actually. A lot of, in a lot of cases, we uh, definitely found some creative solutions, I think, to get around certain traps. There was a point in which, like, the only group that was navigating the dungeon that day, because, you know, Jordan was trapped, 
in his cage for four sessions, and um, and then I eventually also fell into the cage. Yeah, a couple of people got lost outside, <laughs> and a couple of people just couldn't make it in you know IRL. Um, but I think the party was me, Lara. I think you were there too, mm-hmm. and then uh, Selixer, Lenina's character. What's up? <laughs> um, and so, n- pretty much, no one with actual magic ability. Hey, um, and well, useful magic. <laughs> hey, <laughs> well, you could have healed us lines. if the traps had if cut us in two. If that freaking stone golem or whatever had stone hit us, golem. that would have been like. But um, I helped paralyze that. You know, yep. not a whole lot of magic. We were definitely like just flying by the seat of our pants a couple times there for sure. But yeah, well, like, uh, there, and again, the techie characters definitely shined. Well, you know, Magnus. Would spend most of the session kind of in the back with his arms folded. Excuse just hanging me, you single handedly saved yeah. the, uh, Selixir well, when, from when the volcano. St- death. You know, stuff that hits was a one fan. Of my favorite, yeah. That was my favorite but, um, part. There, there was a point fish. in which the uh, <laughs> there was an illusion magic cast. We didn't know it at the time, though, um, in which the cavern had started to collapse. Oh. And um, I have was, a fear of fire. It was that same group of, of, of adventurers. Uh, Laro's character and Magnus were able to sort of make all these physical tests, but uh, whoever was left could not. So it resulted in Magnus and uh, Laro's character just having to throw people across gaps and just, you know, be like, we're getting out of here, you know? And, and the, oh the flying fish in which uh, Magnus picked up Selixir. <clears throat> threw me across and just two lava pits. Threw you across two lava pits, <laughs> I remember yeah. uh, my character... Almost didn't make the first lava jump, and I had, kept using my bennies to make this jump, and I was always, like, one short. And, like, someone had to, like, use a card, and it wasn't, like, the proper card to use, but, like, we bent the rules so I wouldn't die. And then I ran into a portal, and I emerged naked on top of a mountain, and then you followed me for some uh, reason, and you got, guys got caught in the illusion. <laughs> use but, names, please. Um, you okay, so, well. so, Selixer, who is Lenina's character... And I were naked on top of a mountain. We lost all of our equipment, but we were safe. Including the treasure we had come there to find. (laughs) Yeah. So we got this crown of bone that we, well, we thought it was the crown of bone. It was actually a crown of... Obsidian. Obsidian. But we had a different crown. A decoy. Yes. And I also had a magic flute that was going to save us all, at least in my mind. And we lost, we lost all of our equipment while, uh... Laura and Katie's characters were running, trying to make it towards the door, and they didn't, and the illusion finally caught up to them, and we thought, this is it, this is how we all die, and it was revealed that it was an illusion, and we threw the biggest temper tantrum I've was... ever seen. It was like a group uproar, like we were going to riot. For the record, Clayton had taken Laura and I into the other room, um, and, and we were kind of stone-faced, we thought we were dead, and he just started laughing. <laughs> Uh, and, and we were all like, well, this is a poor time for a joke. And he's like, it's an illusion. You're fine. And we're all like, God damn it. <laughs> um, it was amazing. The reason why we were having such trouble getting out is getting in. We had Talon, our wonderful levitating leader. Teleportation mage. Jack of all traits. Jesus himself. <laughs> I not feel like a oh, jack of all traits. Um, a jack of a traits. few very specific traits but that hand, are very handy helpful. traits, yeah. yes. And in that cage, you were just a jack of all asses. <laughs> <laughs> out of, Got him. Out of all the sessions of a uh, campaign that has been one of my favorites of my role playing career, um, those sessions are the worst. <laughs> I I was so miserable. Like not at first. It, the first session it was cool, but. I think the thing is, I, w- I would like to run through that same dungeon using D&D characters in a D&D system, but having such a small spell list, I felt like I was being asked to fix an engine with a hammer. And so I, I had no detect magic, I had nothing for detecting portals or any clever ways of getting around um, couldn't, like, shape stone or do any of the ten million things that people have done playing that adventure. All I had was, like, floating around, poking shit with telekinesis. We had a bunny that you... Oh, a hair that you were poking. Uh, that was we, my idea. Thank we you. literally took a bunny <laughs> and just levitated it onto things to see if it would trigger traps. It, it just took a really long time because we had to sit and, like poke each individual tile in the entire maze of the thing. 
And I also just felt like the the dungeon itself, like the clues, um, weren't very good. They they weren't very clear. Um, you had to do a lot to get a few of those clues, and they didn't give you very much. And you know, with so much <laughs> relying on trial and error, and hence chance, poke the wrong thing, you're done. It's just you're over with you. You lose all your items or you're in a cage forever. Or you just <laughs> die, you know, like the just devastating blows. So yeah, I really did not enjoy that adventure series uh, at all. <laughs> um, while I appreciated the style of it, I felt like a lot of our group was not prepared for the length <laughs> of that encounter specifically. Mm-hmm. Like I, I'm not all like the brightest of people, but I really felt like way in over my head when it came to a lot of that riddle, puzzly stuff, especially when we didn't have as men- many of our uh, el- eloquently smart and educated members of our party. Yeah, I would definitely just, even as a game master, it ran really long. I didn't tell you guys at the time, but I actually cut three rooms. Holy shit. Wow, <laughs> okay. I, well, that ruins what I was going to say. I, I feel like, despite everything, which is true, it was still cool for me to have... Uh, pushes up imaginary glasses, the nerd cred of saying that we've ran Tomb of Horrors and didn't lose anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, dead, didn't, you know, PK anybody. Yeah, we definitely lost um, uh, Talon there for <laughs> a while. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it was cool to me to be thrown into that quintessential, classic, difficult D&D realm where things really don't make a lot of sense, and as a role player, I am pretty decent at puzzles, and I enjoy DMing puzzles uh, that are rooted in sense. There was a chamber full of snakes. It had to be snakes. And my thinking was, well, we plug up the airflow, or we, um, you know, starve them of however they're, you know, getting their sustenance. We, we fill the chamber with smoke, whatever, you know, thinking, oh, it, you know, a chamber like this in a stone dungeon, you fill it with smoke, there has to be some imperfections where smoke would escape. Um, but no, this is a realm where in one room you have a bunch of snakes, in one room you might have a minotaur, in one room you might have an ice dragon, and in these, it's not an ecosystem. Nothing lives there. It's just a magically supported black triangle that is full of God knows what. And so that was a challenge for me, was trying to solve puzzles in that very fantastical, not rooted in reality setting. But it was cool. I mean, overall, like, I'm glad we did it. Do I want to do it again? No. Uh, no. Never. <laughs> did we talk about the bunny yet? <clears throat> the bunny! So it was briefly mentioned, uh, for the record, no bunnies were harmed in the making of this team of horrors. As well as, my character now has a pet bunny. His name is Bernard. To be clear, it is a hare. But... Nestimona doesn't know that, so his name is Bernard. Uh, in the Tomb of Horrors, there is a room where things levitate if you touch something wrong, and we poked Bernard with it, and now we have a floating hair. And so I have him on, like, a piece of rope, and I have, like, a, a buddy balloon, and he's our pet now, and we keep him forever, and I love him, and everybody else tried to kill him. We used him as, sad. We used him as trap kill. testing. They did. Laura wanted... No, who was it? Nina wanted to eat him. Hmm. Um, that would make sense for a werewolf. Hmm. It would. I'd cry. I think to sort of go on my own point from earlier, had this been a tr- like a, th- a traditional D and D game in whatever setting, I would probably still have had the same issues with the dungeon, even if Magnus was in this case a, a three point five barbarian, for example. Mm-hmm. Partly just because you know, primarily combat focused characters are <laughs> not the best in dungeons. Um, they're good for if a skeleton jumps you, you know, they can push it off an ally. Um, or if there's a, you have to fight a minotaur or something like that. But for the most part, they're kind of just, especially a barbarian, mm-hmm. you know, is in the back waiting for something to happen. And so that, I think that was definitely not at anyone's, that's just sort of a traditional role playing thing, you yeah. know. Like, I'm really great at pitched battles and such. But they're the carry golden hit shit. Yep, exactly. I think that was definitely where some of my my issues came from. But again, it was not necessarily because of the dungeon itself. It was more just the overall overarching concept behind being a primarily combat-focused character in a puzzle dungeon. There was a time when you were um, my belayer. You, you had the rope tied to you so that 
You know, people wouldn't just fall or lose their way or something. You, you were a good sort of uh, anchor paperweight. You could yeah. rock. Yep. <laughs> I'd really like to see how that dungeon would be different if you had a, a bigger spread of kinds of casters like D and D groups have. I I would like to know what it would be like if we went in with a wizard and a cleric and a druid and a ranger with some spells and you know a bard <laughs> whatever not to mention all the different wizard schools like abjur and right there are tons and tons of options with that we're we're built more like superheroes than swiss army knives of D wizards or clerics and that that dungeon really required a whole lot more than the tricks we had I definitely agree with you guys. That that was kind of the low point of the campaign so far. Um, what would you guys all say have been some of the high points? What have, what have you really enjoyed so far out of the game? I was talking about this when we were on our break, but I enjoy these characters so much. Uh, very recently, uh, we're in this giant war with the Vikinger. Uh, who are invading the Elven lands. And Magnus happens to be of the Vikinger, and a lot of this has been battling his brethren. And uh, of one of the recent battles, Magnus had this moment where he's like, I'm hurting these people like that I grew up with, that these are my people. And he had this moment where he was like, I don't know what to do. And we all had a chance to talk to him, and we all tried to help him in very unique individual ways that I appreciated so much. And I love that role-playing aspect. I love how intact we get with these characters. Like, um, I draw lots of art for this, and if you want, I can take some pictures and you can put them up on the website. Actually, I already have scanned Great. copies of all Perfect. the pictures, so I will I have, be posting those, yes. Awesome. Uh, like, And I love drawing them. Like, there are these small interpersonal moments. Like, one of my favorite sketches is the moment Lenina's character, wow. Selixir, seduced the enemy uh, Vikinger vampire that we fought right before the Tomb of Horrors. And I drew that happening while everyone was like, nope, nope, not going to happen. We got to kill it with fire. Not to mention, I used an adventure card to do that. So it wasn't just, like, good rolls. It was me using something, being like, I can fix this peacefully. And they're like, no. Yeah. Uh, but he I wanted really like to the whisk you away notes. and do gross things. You're a friend. I wasn't going to let it happen. Bottom line. It's my decision what, what, it's my character's decision what gross things is allowed to be done. Yeah, there. you want to be turned into some kind of blood bag? Is that what you want? Uh-huh. <laughs> all about those from our vampire game. So does Haley from, from Oh this. yeah. Try everything once, you know? <laughs> but yeah, Thank that's you. my favorite moments. Uh, Got some meth. I don't have any meth. I don't have any, I don't have any meth. Excuse me, if my terrible mis- misunderstanding of using the J A P word, that's gotta stay in too. Yeah, but Let's ne- never forget that moment. No, no that moment erase it. Erase it from everyone's memory. I apologize has, profusely. It has been immortalized. God damn it. Um, anyway, who else likes the campaign? Well, I think I, when it comes to RPGs in general, I'm definitely more of a role player. I definitely like getting like inside a character's head and like dealing with NPCs, talking to other PCs, sort of building rapports and like playing a character. And partly that's because I, relatively for the most part, have not made effectual combat characters throughout the many games I've been in. I've had some successes here and there, but for the grand majority of the time when I sit down and, and try to play someone that's pretty combat-oriented, it does not work out the best for me. And so, surprisingly, actually, in this campaign, combat is one of my more favorite parts of it, partly because I feel like with Magnus, I've really made just a... Just a Killing machine. That sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, live it. Own it. Awesome. Um, so you know, I, I definitely think that I made, did the right things and invested in the right spots to sort of make him just really combat proficient, and, and, it, sh- and it shows because I have a lot of fun in combat. And so I think that's a big part of it for me, you know, and, and a lot of this is we're in a mercenary company. Like, there's a lot of fighting for one reason or another, so it gets to come up quite a bit, and I think that's been sort of a... You know, walking into the into a field of four enemies for the first time and using sweep and just cutting all of their heads off with one attack. There's nothing like the feeling, you know. <laughs> oh my God, I Ugh, feel like, that was terrible. Ugh. I feel like exactly the same way about Anna. Like my favorite times have been any point where I get to use the ballista, <laughs> which um, mm-hmm. Talon put on the front, I think, of the Praxium just for me. And uh, the Praxium being one of the, the oh yeah, ships. being one of the ships that we have, 
if I can get a good line of sight, like line up four or five bad guys and just shoot all five motherfuckers at once, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I've really enjoyed the uh, mass combat system quite a bit. I'm I'm really impressed with it. It's it's slick. It's just real streamlined. It it feels like. You know, there's effective things being done by everybody. You don't just have to sit back and, you know, crunch numbers. Um, everybody gets to do their part, and it seems like it it rewards, you know, some good decisions and, and whatnot. But the sea battle stuff, all, everything since we've got boats has been just some of my favorite Jordan, parts you stole of my thunder. <laughs> Sorry, that's the truth, and we can agree. Yeah, that's real cool, because, like, you on the ballista, like, it's it's a little bit more of a direct version of the mass combat rules, where we're all, you know, Voltron with this massive ship and what other whatever other ships we have, and each of us can figure out some really effective thing to do against our opponents, and just having the minis out on the table, like, this is just all very awesome. It's, it's really fun. Well, I was going to say naval combat, but in addition to that, I have really enjoyed some of our moments of peace. Early in the game, oh goodness, I forget when we were... Um... You forget when we had peace? <laughs> <laughs> um, was it in Stonebrook or Messina? It was in one of the human cities. Uh, maybe Stonebrook. <clears throat> um, Southbrook. Or Southbrook. Basically, we had just decimated this necromancer... Uh, this necromancer, um, <laughs> and his army of skeletons, and, um... Skele- skeletons? Uh, it's, I'm talking. It's my turn <laughs> to talk. And we had a moment to go and relax in a tavern, um, which is, you know, just some classic fantasy RPG fare there. And I had a great, great night that night, walking around, and we all sort of split up into groups of three or four and we're just kind of role playing, and um, you know, most of us were drinking IRL uh, responsibly, of course, and just really having a lot of fun connecting character to character, which was the first time that happened, and it hasn't happened quite like that too many times since. I think that that wouldn't have happened without us all sitting down at character creation. Clayton had us fill out some questions about our characters and talk about it. You know, what are our goals? Why are we loyal to the group? Um, under what circumstances would our characters retire? These things really helped us forge some very common bonds, especially coming out of that uh, Factions Apocalyptia game. My goodness. Uh, that, that's been a very cool part of Ibana for me. Yeah, um, I also really like, uh, we've only done this like once or twice, but uh, like campfire sessions where like at the end of an encounter we'll like sit around a campfire and in in game, not in real life. Although that would be great if we could do that in real life. Uh, and we pulled cards and like if it's red it's something good, if it's black it's something bad, and then like the number like gives you like what you have to say. And you learn more about each other's backstory and then you have like things that happen in between adventures that I really appreciate. But also selfishly on a tangent. One of my favorite things I like about this game is uh, Katie and I always play characters that hate each other in almost every game that we've ever played. And this game... Oh, did... it all started back when... <laughs> in Hunter. Well, even before then, you joined that Apocalyptia one-shot in which we were all playing high-level characters assaulting the robot factory. Oh, and God, And yeah. I was the oh commanding my God. officer. Yeah, and, and I K- just... KP was my uh, <laughs> lieutenant. To which you didn't like something we did, so you just pulled your gun on him, and I was like, "What are you doing?" Uh, I shoot what him. My character would have died. I, I shoot him. What in the arm? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I've grown a lot. Quote. I've Quote grown a lot. <laughs> now you have. I would completely agree with that. Um, but um, no, yeah, that's that started yeah. sort of a trend in which our characters have just sort of been at, at each other's throats. at each other's throats. Yeah, and then uh, I killed her. <laughs> yeah, you did. Well, I I pulled the trigger. You hired it. Anyway, that that's for another podcast session. Uh, but what I love about this game is that I feel like we've grown a lot as, like, role players and friends and characters, and I love the bond that Magnus and Desdemona have, specifically from that session in the tavern where Desdemona was going around asking people individually if they wanted to be her dad, because that's what she does. And Magnus was standing behind these, like, like, like... He, are you her dad or not? You, you, you better say 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 yes or no, because I will mess you up. Dad, not daddy. <laughs> dad, not daddy. Yeah, uh, just like the bond that 
our characters have. And I feel like all of these characters have these, like, really intricately woven relationships with each other that are, like, really well-earned. Like, nothing's like, oh, they're friends now. Like, they're earned relationships. And I feel that a lot of the character development is, like, it takes time and... Everything's earned, and, you know, like, I cry a lot about this game because I'm just an emotional person, but, like, it's all earned tears, and I really love this story and these characters, and the little in-between moments when we're not fighting make my day. From a game master's stance, I am constantly worried that I'm forgetting someone, that I'm letting somebody sit at the table for too long without doing anything, because we are such a large group. At one point, we were nine I think we are nine. We were We're a little shorter now. And I know Lenina's character really hasn't had her story pick up yet. Nina's werewolf, I haven't even, I haven't even touched that story yet. I estimate that we're about halfway through the campaign. I do have something planned for you guys. It is coming, (laughs) but I constantly struggle with the fact that I feel like I'm not involving everyone in the group and in the stories that are going on. And I'm, I want to apologize if I haven't gotten to you yet, just because I don't want you to sit there at the game and be witnessing all these other people having fun. That's, I'm, that's what I, that's my biggest fear as a game master is that players will be sitting here watching other people have fun. I've tried to help you out with that a little bit and yes. And I shoulder the burden some, one of the, one of the things, the load. One of the things about this game that, for me personally, I really enjoyed is being the leader. Not because I've been able to be, like, you know, some megalomaniac, but because we can cut through all the bullshit of everybody arguing about what we ought to do and instead just be like, okay, obviously, you're going to kick in the door. You're going to cover him. You're going to organize people. You're going to get ready to heal people. You know, everybody knows what they're supposed to do, and everybody knows what they're good at. But for some reason in role-playing games where it's just sandbox and there's no authority, people are going to sit here and debate for ages about what to do. And so it's, I like to sit back and do my own thing or whatever after assigning stuff and just seeing it all play out. Like, I'm playing this meta game with all these other characters, and it's awesome. But yeah, I've... I know what you're talking about, and people sitting there with not much going on, and it's hard to figure out assignments for everybody all the time, but I hope you're wrong about the halfway point thing. If you told me we were like 15 or 20 percent of the way through, I'd be fine. But <laughs> there really is a ton more story going on with all these different characters, yeah. and I mean, I get kind of sad thinking about like, all right, this is the hump, it's... To be fair, the amount of time that I expected to take to get to this point was way shorter than how it actually took. (laughs) So, in reality, we might only be a third of the way, or even shorter. Right now, this is the longest campaign I've run. We're a third of the... We're a half to a third of the way done. And I still have as much steam and momentum for this campaign as I had at the beginning. And I have never encountered that in 20 years. <laughs> That's awesome. Ooh. For the record, I think we started in November of last year. It's been 17, and at least we 17 did have sessions, so 17 weeks of playing. November 6th is my huh. cool. creation date here. The, the university, many of us had to go on, many, many of you, I'm, I'm not a student, uh, had to go on break, and so we did have a hiatus, but except for that, we've been playing constantly. Mm-hmm. And I'm super pumped that Summer here has worked out so we can keep doing it. Mm-hmm. I had something actually useful to say, damn it. Um, personally, I signed on for the, oh man, I'm going to play a pacifist in a realm where we're going to go and travel the world. A lot of it, I still have a ton of fun. I feel like we all do. I feel like it just comes and goes with everything. Nothing can be fun 100% of the time. Like not even sports or video games. Like There's a lot of times you're just like, oh man... Just got to get through yeah. get through the puzzle, get through the jungle. I, I think that was, that's what I was going to say, that was the only point where, you know, my um, foolish hand trying to keep a pulse on the game here seemed to realize maybe, ah, people are, like, kind of, like, looking at their watches here would be just that the Tomb of Horrors, like, exactly how you said, a lot of people didn't have the skill sets to do it, took a long time. 
But, I mean, we, we did it. We got through it. We, we, we earned the afterwards. cred. We kicked its ass. We got some really amazing stuff that Hello allowed loot. us to get a ship Hello that unlocked loot. the entire flat Earth. One thing I forgot was where this name ah, for this world oh, came yeah. from. Mm -hmm. The world itself is called Abena. Whenever we first created the world, no, nothing had names. Everything was named by the players. Um, my cities had names day one. That is true. You're you are on the stick, as they say. You had your. <laughs> and if I had a video camera to show Kyle, <laughs> which just, is just picture a proud bird. <laughs> Does anybody want to say where the name of the world came from? Well, that's shit. I actually just put flat world into Google Translate and kept, looked down through the list until I found something that I thought sounded pretty. And the word in Esperanto for flat is Ebena. So that's the name of the world. And following Beth's lead, every time I've needed something um, in some other language, for human lands, I use uh, Esperanto if the player characters come across something in an, an ancient human for the Vikinger, I use I use Swedish. I haven't had a chance to use any other languages yet in the campaign, but it is coming. But Google Translate has been very awesome. Um, I've come up with the names of a, the five dragons that the um, player characters have heard of and or encountered at this point. I got from Google Translate and hold on, the dragons have names. Oh yes. Can um, you tell we us? We killed one of them too quick to learn the name of. You, you, <laughs> you've actually killed. Two of them at this point. Yeah. Dragon Slayers! I mean, just a second and I'll have the name of the dragon. So, the eldest and most powerful of the dragons is El Andning, which directly translated means fire breath. Dotsbringer, which is death bringer. And Antenstock, which is um, aerial stalker. Hmm. What are the two we've killed? I, I don't like that one. I don't like the aerial stalker one. That sounds <laughs> bad. <laughs> sounds bad for the Zephyr. Yeah. We're in the air. <laughs> <laughs> the other two died too quickly. I didn't have a chance to come up with a name for them. Thanks, uh, thank God. Uh, dead one and werewolf. Dead two. And okay. Talon. Lovely. Lovely. <laughs> Wolf ripped and telekilled. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan definitely needs to tell oh, that telefrag. story. Oh, That's what it was called. Of how he killed quake. the dragon. Because I've got a real stupid, weird little story to tell okay. along those lines. Basically, coming from that. We had a, an aerial battle where we were trying to take back the Wind Tamed, and we were each on griffins, and the opposing force was mostly made up of wyverns with some riders, Viking or riders, led by a dragon. We made fairly short work of the wyverns, you know, just killing their riders was enough in a lot of those cases. I befriended one. We, uh... We had our werewolf uh, dive onto the dragon in her human form. and That was a mistake. <laughs> it, was, it was a mistake. Yeah, she but, forgot she wasn't a werewolf yet. But she, was, she was unable to perform uh, under stress. <laughs> and so she's just dangling there as a, a small girl on the back of a dragon. Um, it was looking pretty bad. I, I, I teleported over there and started stabbing it with my lightsaber sword <laughs> magic thing. Wasn't doing much good. It reached back, nailed me, did a bunch of damage. Um, it was like three wounds. Yeah, I, I'm i falling off. I'm going in the water. I'm done. And from what I can tell, the rest of my team are going to get ripped to shreds by this dragon. And so, Hail Mary, I decide to teleport just above the dragon... And then use this spell ghost form, which is just kitty pride, like insubstantial for a minute um, kind of power. Then fall backward into the dragon, and when I'm inside of it, rematerialize on purpose. And in Savage Worlds, that is pretty well auto-kill for both parties involved. I don't know what it looked like from everybody else's perspective. It amazing um, and terrifying. But the dragon, you know, I guess it, it didn't explode, right? It, just, it basically like, had like a heart attack, heart attack or, kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> yeah. And then it it tumbles into the water where there are krakens that the <laughs> uh, the sawhagen had brought as part of the war effort, and a kraken grabbed that dragon and ate it. So 
I was in the belly of a dragon, in the belly of a kraken. Mm-hmm. And that is the last that anybody has seen of me. And it was pretty cool. And so I think it was last Thursday, Haley said something about how you were like having an invisibility ring. And she's like, I'll bet he's just floating around watching us. So a couple days later, I actually have a dream <laughs> Where it was like a series of little vignettes where I would just be doing like really mundane things like like eating or sleeping or whatever. And all of a sudden, you would snap your fingers and appear in a robe and a wizard hat and be like... <laughs> and be like, Taylon, Taylon is watching you sleep. <laughs> Taylon is watching you eat. And like, I had a bunch of these. Wait, he the, does that to you too? And then the funny... <laughs> and then the best you one was at the very was end. <laughs> The best one was at the very end because I was sitting in the bathroom and I hear a little snap right here and then I hear, Dalon is watching you poop. (laughs) (laughs) I could have drawn that. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) You see, if I had that power, I would just teleport behind KD and just say, It's free. I do it twice. <laughs> you have to decide which meme to use first, because like the other one's not going to have the same amount of impact. That's the mystery of it. <laughs> anyway, all right, guys, what do you say? We had enough of this bullshit, and let's. We can't really top that. <laughs> <laughs> I still yeah, can't you ruined it. the outro. <laughs> This has been a production of Alien Familiar Media. You can find past episodes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. This production is protected under a Creative Commons Attribution No Derivatives License. Music for this episode is Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale and can be found at freemusicarchive.org.